Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's presentation on immigrant health. During this session, our panelists will discuss issues on health inequities impacting immigrants from access to care to health outcomes. Today's event is sponsored by the HMS Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Partnership, where I serve as Dean for this office. The mission of DICP is to advance diversity and inclusion in health, biomedical, behavioral, and STEM fields in ways that build individual and institutional capacity to achieve excellence, foster innovation, and ensure equity in health locally, nationally, and globally. DICP efforts support the career development of junior faculty, trainees and students, and identifies and trains leaders in academic medicine and health policy, and also provides programs that address crucial, crucial pipeline pathways issues. This is also part of an annual lecture series through the Equity and Social Justice Initiative, which was established to address issues related to health disparities, social determinants of health, leadership and health systems, health policy, and other areas affecting vulnerable populations. ESJ, Equity and Social Justice events, focus on four areas, history and context, culture and environment, health disparities, and the fourth, leadership and skills development. Just some housekeeping. For those of you who are joining today, the chat's not available, microphones will be muted, but you can use the Q&A to post questions to panelists. And this is being recorded and will be posted on the DICP, Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Partnership website. And it's now my, indeed my pleasure to introduce Dr. Alden Landry, an emergency medicine physician at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine, and Assistant Dean in the Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Partnership at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Landry. Thank you, uh, Dr. Reed, for the introduction, and thank you for continuing to support this effort as we continue to have these discussions around equity and social justice uh, in medicine. When we started these conversations back in 2016, uh, the goal was really to figure out how to have these tougher conversations that don't necessarily fit cleanly within your traditional medical education models, whether it be for undergraduate, graduate, or continuing medical education. And I think the Equity and Social Justice Lecture Series has allowed us to have those tougher conversations in a space uh, where we can bring in the experts, hear their conversations, um, be inspired by the work that they're doing, and also be thoughtful about the work that we want to do as we go forward um, in our work to advance health equity. And so with that, I wanna introduce our panelists because I don't wanna take too much time um, from their conversation and, and hearing from them as they lead us on this discussion around immigrant, immigrant health care. Uh, so first is Dr. Uh, Altaf Sadi. She is a general neurologist at Massachusetts General Hospital and an assistant professor of neurology here at Harvard Medical School. She is also an associate director for the uh, Massachusetts General Asylum Clinic. Her federally funded research focuses on eliminating neurologic and neuropsychiatric health disparities with a focus on addressing the needs of immigrant and forcibly displaced populations, both within the community and in uh, immigration detention. Uh, she is. Uh, she was named uh, the 2021 one of the 2021 National Minority Quality Forum 40 Under 40 Leaders in Minority Health, and also received the 2023 Bernard Lown uh, Award for Social Responsibility. Uh, and uh, shout out to the NMQF 40 Under 40, uh, as uh, I am also a, a member of the 40 Under 40 back when I was still under 40. Uh, next is Dr. Maria Portella. Uh, she is a chief of the family medicine section for the Department of Emergency Medicine and uh, at the Medical Faculty Associates of George Washington University. She is a previous Commonwealth Fund fellow uh, and has been uh, and has served uh, immigrant populations throughout the years, mostly uh, most recently in her role uh, as the healing uh, clinic medical director, a student run clinic for uninsured patients. Dr. Portella has taken diverse leadership roles and has served in health equity on a local, state, and national level. Uh, she is passionate about increasing access and quality uh, for healthcare services to vulnerable populations and teaching mentorship, uh, diversity, and inclusion. And last but not least is Dr. Vinay Verma, who is a practicing psychiatrist also at Massachusetts General Hospital. Uh, he has spearheaded initiatives to uh, in expanding and improving access to quality mental health care services through his role as the former director of the Rapid Access at uh, MGH and has uh, the inaugural 
medical director for the Vin, uh, VinFin Community Behavioral Health Center. Dr. Verma has worked extensively with immigrant populations uh, here in Boston and communities such as Dorchester, Chelsea, and uh, just north of us in Lowell. Uh, he was also a prior recipient of the World Psychiatric Association's Early Career Fellowship Award for his work in the Boston Center for Refugee Health and Human Rights. Um, and so as you can see, based upon our speakers, uh, we have chosen individuals who are really uh, thoughtful in this space and who have been engaged in the work uh, caring for immigrant populations. And so with that, I want to turn it over to you, to uh, Dr. Saadi, with my first question. Um, and it's really more of a statement. Can you just help to set the stage of where we're at um, uh, locally here in Boston, in the state of Massachusetts, and then also what's happening on a national level uh, when it comes to uh, specific issues related to immigrant health? Uh, well, first of all, um, thank you for the invitation to be part of this um, group and for organizing um, to a conversation about this talk. Um, I don't know if this is sort of where you were headed with that uh, converse, uh, with that question, but I'm going to even take it a step back um, because I think the issue of immigration has become really um, politicized to the point that I always encourage people to take a step back, even when we uh, talk about or think about what frames we're adopting when discussing this issue. Um, so the first thing I had um, thought about even, uh, or this is just sort of like really pressing on my mind was recently I was part of a team that was talking about immigration as a social determinant of health. And we were trying to prep um, a, a course or lecture around that topic to uh, HMS students. And someone said, oh, let's talk about, or let's make sure to address the migrant crisis. And I said, hold up. Like, let's take a step back here. Like, what's with that language, right? We need to really, even when before talking about these issues, need to question these implicit frames that have um, become, they're unfortunately too dominant in conversation about immigrant health, right? So we need to stop describing immigrants as a crisis, right? Or as just problem of increasing numbers. And I think we, um, there's a slippery slope with sort of in, even engaging in language like that with what, what had happened in the prior administration, right, and um, fear mongering that had happened in terms of describing people as caravans or floods, right, of uh, immigrants coming. And I think, um, you know, there's hyperbolic language when it comes to uh, immigrant health, there's stigmatizing language. Um, and we have to just be really clear, like even when we're talking about, oh, there's been like 20,000 people coming to Massachusetts, there have been X number of people coming to California, we need to just be really clear and sort of not engaging um, in that discourse and saying that the issue is not in people existing or seeking safety or fighting, you know, for survival. Um, and so I just sort of that big picture, but thinking about sort of like framing and thinking about this issue. Um, there's sort of two other points I wanted to make about that, if that's okay, Alden, um, which was sort of related to this. I, I'll share just in terms of personally, my family is from Iraq and um, had uh, fled uh, uh, Iraq um, as uh, refugees. They were persecuted both for religious reason and, and ethnicity reasons. Um, and then when the Iraq war had happened in 20, in 2003, I just remember uh, you know, it was where my family's from, it was just a like, very traumatic experience. But afterwards, people would just talk about like Iraqi refugees just existing as if what happened, you know, as if they're just, it was inevitable or just this natural byproduct of events. And I, um, which just always gets so frustrated that it like, it, it wasn't, right? That the war was a deliberate policy decision that happened, right? It led to people being displaced. It led to the migration issues that happened. And I think you know it's the same in terms of what's happening in Gaza right now that we know that at least 70% of Gaza's population has been displaced. And I just think it's really important uh, when we talk about these issues and when we talk about, okay, people are coming into Massachusetts, people are coming into California, that we can talk about how to address those, right? At the um, local, state, national level, but underlying all of it needs to be, how do we address the root causes of migration, right? of why are people flowing uh, from place to place? Why are people coming from Haiti? Why are people leaving Gaza? Why are people you know, um, fleeing uh, Iraq? So, um, uh, so I think that's sort of like the big picture that I think is important um, for us to think about when we uh, think about uh, issue of immigration and migrant health. So, you know, as you 
Thank like, you, Verse, for pointing that out because I think we do get lost in sort of um, what we hear on the news and we forget that, again, these are humans, um, individuals um, that have their own specific needs um, and in particular the health needs. And I know we're going to talk a little bit more about the structural and social determinants of health. But, you know, as we talk about where um, immigrant health is most needed and what's what what spaces need to be filled, who is actually taking the lead um, for those individuals who are coming to the United States who do need um, health uh, resources, even the most basic health resources, uh, both on a local, regional and national level? And then also, um, who's filling the gaps uh, or is anyone filling the gaps uh, to support uh, individuals and their health needs? You know, unfortunately, in the U.S., it's been incredibly fragmented in the same way that healthcare is fragmented. Unfortunately, the response to um, you know uh, uh, migration flows into our country has been very fragmented and it's been very regional. Um, so we see some states, so California and Massachusetts being examples of those, where there's been like state level response, right? So both in California and Massachusetts, there's sort of been these um, uh, in, in Massachusetts, they're called sort of these welcome centers, right, that the state has uh, supported and funded in California sort of similarly at the state level, there was funding that was um, put forth by the governor to say, look, we will give money and support sort of this regional um, uh, uh, effort to try to put people in shelters to try to connect them to resources. Uh, there are there have been limits to that. So in Massachusetts, for example, um, we knew that initially there was sort of this uh, right to shelter, uh, to right to emergency shelter that was initially in place where everyone had to get placed somewhere. But uh, unfortunately, that sort of ran out. And so um, we have already begun hearing of stories, of, you know, uh, just this just uh, yesterday I was on a call um, and uh, hearing about uh, a woman in her second trimester, a Haitian woman who was turned away from a, a shelter um, in, in the 30 degree um, uh, weather uh, here in Boston. Um, so uh, unfortunately, even at the state level, that's been um, you know not fully effective, but I think there are some states who have at least taken a state level approach. I think in other places, it's really just been at the city level um, so New York City being an example of that, that unfortunately not so much of a response at a state level, but at least in the city, there has been like these processing or welcome centers where people can come and they're connected to various uh, resources. And I think um, this sort of goes back to to address that. We just need to keep going up, right? We need to go up to these levels in, in the context of the U.S. We need to be thinking about how um, the federal government really should be responsible for relocation of immigrants um, to make sure that there's better coordination uh, when you're you know, sending or receiving people. Um, right now, it's sort of a hodgepodge effort, unfortunately. Um, you know, going to uh, back to one of the original statements that you were making about sort of recognizing humanity uh, that comes into play um, in these situations. I think, unfortunately, there comes a level of um, um, racism that comes into play. Uh, we don't have to have these conversations about uh, the, the the phobias and the isms that also come into play when we talk about individuals who are uh, coming to our country um, and uh, ultimately have health care needs. So can you connect the dots for us between racism, intersectionality, and other issues that may be existing with the social and structural determinants of health? Um. Thank you so much for asking that question. I um I think this is a drum that I beat sort of any time I try to talk about this topic is that we really need to uh, connect the dots between uh, immigration policies here in, here in the U.S. and sort of uh, racism. So U.S. immigration laws really emerged from the U.S.'s project as a white settler state. So there, you know, going back to 1790, there was the, a Naturalization Act which limited U.S. citizenship to white people. Um, right. And then a subsequent some of the initial laws um, um, uh, excluded um, free black immigrants from citizenship. We have the uh, Chinese Exclusion Act, which is one of the first immigration laws that excluded Chinese uh, immigrants. So I think from the very outset, the immigration policies that we see in this country have been very much rooted um, in uh, racism. And as I mentioned, sort of this ideology of America as a, a white settler state. Um, and I think that uh, we continue to see remnants of that right to this day, even when we are looking at differential responses to 
uh, immigrants coming from Ukraine or Haiti, right? Um, right now, uh, in the context of what's happening in uh, Palestine, you know, I've been thinking about, are, is there a TPS? Is there some sort of expedited way, the same way that we had Ukrainians come? And there isn't, right? So the, I think we're still seeing a differential response to different immigrants when they come to the U.S. Um, and I think, again, thinking and rooting that um, in the long history of racism uh, in the U.S. is important and I think is really central to uh, the conversation about immigration. Um, so in a lot of papers that I've written about this topic, I always try to sort of mention or include like at least a paragraph that's like, look, this is contextualized within this larger mm -hmm. history, even when we go back to, you know, the first uh, laws um, passed around immigration in this country. No, thank you for that. I think it's really important for us to be settled in the fact that a lot of um, the um, laws that you see or the issues that you see that are happening today, um, we were dealing with um, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago in this country, uh, and the remnants of racism, the remnants of um, uh, exclusionary acts uh, still carry over to some of the um, uh, positions that we see policymakers making today and unfortunately lead to um, poor health outcomes for individuals that are trying to come to our country. Um, so thank you for that. And I, I, I want to uh, switch to you. Th thank you, Dr. Sadi, for, for the introduction. I want to switch to Dr. Burma uh, to lead us on our next part of this discussion, because I think it's important for us to sort of drill down on what this actually looks like from a health perspective. And we're going to talk about um, uh, immigrant health from a mental health perspective, but then also uh, from just a general primary care uh, health perspective. Uh, but Dr. Verma, can you tell us, you know, what are the mental health needs uh, that our uh, individuals coming to our country, what are they facing, what are they experiencing, and what are you seeing as someone who's providing care uh, for, for these populations coming to, uh, to see you in clinic or seeing in the emergency department? Great. Well, thank you for having me. Um, your question is very loaded, so I'm going to try to break it apart a little bit. Um, it's, it's obviously a, quite a complex issue. Um, in terms of the kind of mental health needs, I think we do need to take a step back and see where those needs are rising from, right? So is it okay if I share my slide? Um, I think it'll be um, quite helpful for folks here. Let's see. Perfect, yes. So the migration trajectory can be divided into three different components, right? So the pre-migration, the flight and post-migration challenges. And the reason I'm bringing that up here is because the prevalence of specific types of mental health um, conditions um, that I see in the clinic and that have been reported in the literature um, and by different um, centers for refugee health, um, they really commented how the nature of these experience in terms of diversity is experienced before, during, and after resettlement really determines the prevalence and the trajectory of the, men the diagnosed mental health conditions. Um, so the, in terms of the pre-migration, you know, as Dr. Saadi was alluding, as she was mentioning about the refugees, right? So. Um, fleeing that area, the country of origin, because of well-founded fear. Um, and also certainly the forcibly displaced folks because of war and variety of other stressors. During their um, actual experience, when they're fleeing the country of origin, several difficult traumatic experiences, such as you know being afraid of their arrest, uh, kidnapping, sexual trafficking. It, it's actually um, quite um, an interesting one that we don't necessarily talk about a whole lot um, in the clinical space, although it's picked up steam lately. When I was spending my time at the Boston Center for Refugee Health and Human Rights, um, this was unfortunately quite commonly reported to me as I was working on the affidavits for those and how that impacted the nature of the trauma symptoms and the trajectory of their PTSD um, was quite important to note. In terms of post-migration challenges, uh, Dr. Saadi, I'm totally with you on that about the social determinants piece as well, not necessarily pre, but also post-migration, uh, especially the structural constraints of discrimination, the systemic factors that lead to that, right? And we know that's been shown to systemically restrict opportunities for social mobility, um, availability and quality of um, 
care access, right? And the increased risk of exposure to uh, violence and, and so on. So to your um, question, Alden, about the mental health needs, if you could please uh, go to the next slide, that will address um, that um, question. Perfect. So refugees and folks who have been forcibly displaced, they are reported in literature to have about up to 30% um, the prevalence for PTSD. Now it's complex PTSD, that is. I think clinically it's important to distinguish. We won't go in the weeds of it um, because PTSD generally is restricted to a discrete event or a series of a few events, right? So the complex is this, this repeated traumatic exposure that folks um, tend to experience in the in the slide that I just um, showed you. So the strongest predictor for those are really the exposure to the, the torture and the cumulative number of those traumatic incidents. So the mental health needs really are around providing treatment for that, but also screening folks. I think clinically where we run into um, challenges when folks are establishing care and taking a step back from that even is where are they in the process of establishing care once they are you know here in the area how are they accessing care i think we as a system certainly need to um reassess that um framework a, a bit more and if we are to improve the access um issues right so um, I know that's a lot, so I'll, I'll pause there and, and see if um, you have any more questions, and I'm happy to expand on that. No, I think that was a, a great segue into this. And, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned, um, you know, PTSD, and I was uh, actually listening to an NPR story uh, yesterday, and they were talking about a family um, that recently came to Massachusetts, but they lost their housing because... Uh, the child uh, was suffering from depression and the family bought a pet uh, for them. But unfortunately, the shelter that they were staying in doesn't allow pets. And so therefore, the entire family um, had to leave uh, the shelter because uh, they broke a rule. And just thinking about uh, the trauma that the child had experienced in the in coming to the United States and the depression and just understanding that, you know, there was um, a system that was in place that was, uh, you know, a part of the problem and uh, creating more barriers for the family. And I know we're going to talk more about social and structural drivers of health, uh, but I just, I th I th that story really touched me on, you know, just, again, we don't, we, we're talking about this in sort of big picture, but we have to remember that these humanity uh, tied to this. And oftentimes we overlook the children that are uh, a part of this picture. Um, but I do want to stick with the big picture. Can you talk about, um, you know, what, physicians and others can be doing uh, to collaborate with decision makers uh, and other individuals sort of involved in this process um, and caring for the uh, mental health and psychological needs of uh, individuals that are uh, here in the United States as immigrants? Absolutely. I, I think it starts with the awareness first of the, the gravity of the, the challenges and the gravity of the issues that are, you know, that sort of are determined and pose challenges for our patients to access care. So I think being aware is one. The second piece is about advocacy work, right? So working with the lawmakers here uh, on, the, on the Hill and also to various agencies in the area because one part of treatment is the, 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 part, the process of healing that takes place is quite collectively and partnering up with community organizations to empower these groups collectively really holds the, the key, um, and that's been shown uh, across different studies, to healing, right? So partnering up with community organization, faith leaders, uh, lawyers, and, um, and certainly students, um, dental clinics, really including the whole un interdisciplinary framework in the treatment team empowers the communities as a whole and also then it leads to collective healing. And there are multiple oh. resources that I'm happy to share outside of this forum as well. Yeah, I, I, if, if you have an example, feel free to share now. Um, if not, I can go on to the next question. I wasn't 
Uh, my apologies for interrupting. Oh, no, 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 that's, that's totally fine. So let me just pull up that. Um, so the Boston Center for the Refugee Health and Human Rights on their webpage, they have quite a exhaustive list of resources that folks are able to utilize when they arrive in the area. And um, there is an immigration, it used to be called Irish Immigration Center. Um, and also the Harvard Law School has a pro bono service for folks as well. So those are two common resources that I have utilized in the past. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because we as um, physicians uh, speaking for uh, physician colleagues, uh, but just clinicians in general, we often um, feel as if we are restricted to only operate within our domain of um, the practice of medicine. And I think it's helpful for us to recognize that there's partners that are out there that we can collaborate with to improve care for others um, and who honestly know more resources and um, and are more able to engage in spaces that uh, we can uh, because uh, of our either assumed uh, limited ex uh, experience and expertise or also uh, just the constraints that we may feel that we have uh, just because of the pressures of being a, a physician and not able to offer the resources that uh, and, the, and the assistance that uh, our patients may need, in particular those uh, who are immigrants. Um, can you can you just quickly break this down for us a little, little bit more on the micro level, focusing on you know what we can be doing, especially for those physicians and clinicians who are listening in, um, to um, be more engaged uh, with this patient population, how we can be more thoughtful, uh, whether it is uh, how we... Um, you know, talk to our patients, working with interpreters, uh, thinking about other sort of contexts that may be in place um, when we're caring for patients, in particular from a, from a mental health perspective. Certainly. I, I think that's a great question. I do want to emphasize that the, the use of the resource navigators as well, how important their role is in, um, you know, helping our patients connect with quality resources as well. The in terms of the clinical work that I do and what's been shown to be effective, so in, for the mental health perspective, so DSM-5, as you know, that's the, um, we use that for diagnostic uh, purposes. So there is a section about the cultural formulation and the cultural interview there, and that's thoughtfully um, formulated. So I would encourage folks to look into that. Um, even if they're not a psychiatrist, I'm, I'm happy to share links as well because um, it certainly helps folks to sort of think and approach um, the interviews in a different format slightly. And the reality is most of us uh, in our practices have such a short amount of time. So how do we build rapport with this highly, you know, is with someone who may have a very highly traumatized um, history, right? Because building rapport and avoiding re-traumatization really would be the key goals for the first few sessions as we're trying to engage in care. So, so that's one. The other aspect really is to become more comfortable and become more aware um, about the trauma-informed care models. And I know at HMS, there's those sessions going on with introducing that concept to um, the students, but also certainly for the clinicians as well, I would encourage that. And the few other resources that folks are welcome to utilize are the interpreters, right? So they're not only cultural brokers, but they are so instrumental in the positive therapeutic alliance that we build with our patients and for the positive outcomes. So I think expanding, becoming more comfortable with the standard of care of how well to utilize the interpreters in the sessions without, um, well, well, certainly making them a key person and the interaction, I think that's a, that's a really important thing to consider. The other aspects um, to be mindful of, because many of our patients are coming from these collectivist um, communities, right, the cultures, being mindful of that as we are formulating our treatment plans and because individual well-being may not go that far if we are not putting their presenting complaint within their context and what shapes their experience. So I think being thoughtful around that is uh, it's quite important. Thank you, uh, Dr. Verma, for providing us that context. And uh, I'm going to turn to Dr. Portella. Dr. Portella, did you want to add to uh, what Dr. Verma was just speaking on? 
Yes, and thank you so much for <clears throat> inviting me to the panel. And it's an honor to share the panel with Dr. Verma and Sadi and Dr. Sadi and, and yourself. Um, one thing that I wanted to add is that um, I am a primary care physician and as a primary care physician, you can also do a lot of, a lot of uh, good in this space. One of the things that you can do if you're a primary care physician, if you are an OBGYN, if you are a geriatrician, if you're a psychiatrist, if you, you know, if you're a geriatrician, you can add and pursue additional training through either the asylum network or the asylum training initiative. And uh, Physicians for Human Rights is another example. They offer free trainings that are virtual. They were in person before the COVID-19 pandemic, and now they have a, a virtual formats. Um, it's, it doesn't uh, mean that after you complete the training, you are the, uh, an expert. We want to understand that this is a very complex uh, you know, situation for, for our patients, right? The, the, that are undergoing this this migration, right? And the trauma is essentially constant, right? Throughout those four phases. But it is a continuous education activity that you can be involved in that allows you to be part of um, the evaluation, the um, affidavit, and part of, um, and, and being able to develop a, a very important part of, of somebody's case. Um, so, you, I think the basic training is probably around 15 hours. And then after that, there's a lot of subspecialty training, depending on whether you are trained to also see kids or you want to dive into more psychiatry. So I would recommend everybody to that's interested to look into that and also to join the Asylum Network and Physicians for Human Rights as they have a lot of volunteer opportunities and can help link you with one of the local asyl asylum networks in your area versus you can join also and with a mentor and consider um, providing asylum care in your clinic. And I'm going to turn to you, Dr. Sadi, because I know you wanted to add to this conversation as well. I will say so, you know, I'm the associate director of our asylum clinic here at Mass General. And I just to add that I think it's really open to even specialists. So I'm a neurologist and I conduct these evaluations. Um, there is a need to uh, evaluate, uh, you know, people with cognitive issues or with seizures. Just most recently, I actually partnered with a neurosurgeon um, to uh, write a report for someone who um, unfortunately had a, a, a bullet wound to the head and needed um, neurosurgical um, uh, uh, neurosurgery sort of to address that. And we, we wanted to um, move up his hearing date to, uh, to account for sort of his surgical needs. So I just sort of wanted to add the piece that it really is open um, across uh, medicine. There's a need um, for that regardless of uh, what specialty uh, you might be practicing in and also open to non-clinicians. So we have psychologists, uh, social workers, uh, you know, nurse practitioners who are also sort of doing that as well. And I just want to share that uh, as an emergency physician, I think it's important for individuals from my specialty be engaged in this space uh, because we are often the first line or, or only source of care for many uh, patients. And so uh, the call to, to action includes uh, emergency medicine physicians as well. Uh, jumping back to you, Maria, I wanted to sort of talk a little bit more about the primary care needs. We talked about the mental health needs, uh, especially uh, as Dr. Verma mentioned with the PTSD uh, that may be happening and then, um, you know, whatever um, other mental health needs, whether it be depression, anxiety uh, that come along with uh, being here in the country and the, the, the uh, stressors that these uh, individuals coming to uh, our country are facing uh, as immigrants. But uh, we'll, uh, you know, we 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 need to focus on their primary care needs as well. And so, can you talk about some of the uh, things that you've seen as uh, as a primary care physician and caring for patients uh, who are newly arrived to our country? Absolutely, and thank you both for establishing the needs for specialists also in this space. Uh, I was uh, trying to think about how m many times I hear primary care physicians just say, "But I'm only a primary care physician." But you can do a lot of things as a primary care physician because also sometimes we're the 
first point of contact if the person comes to a federally qualified health center or a community health center. I think one of the things that I wanted to highlight is uh, an earlier point from Dr. Sari that's so incredibly important about the intersectionality about social determinants of health. So through the primary care lens, when you encounter somebody that has migration as a social determinant of health, to me, my primary care lens still thinks about primary care, but thinks about it in a more uh, in-depth way in the sense that I'm thinking about the person's individual factors, that life, the lifestyle factors that they may have, mainly by asking them more pointed questions about those things in a trauma-informed um, approach, like Dr. Verma mentioned. I'm also thinking about their living conditions. I'm thinking about their working conditions. So I may not ask maybe the, some of these questions to any patient that I, that I encounter, but I may take extra time to kind of diving into some of these issues that may be particular for that patient. Also, I may think about the social and community factors, right, in terms of Dr. Sadi mentioned, I mean, we're in a very, uh, we're in a tumultuous time. There is also, uh, there is blatant uh, racism and discrimination against uh, many immigrants. And that also needs to take into account in terms of like how the person, the patient actually presents and how much the patient is maybe traumatized as Dr. Verma mentioned at the moment, but also how, how comfortable or not they may be willing to share. So. In terms of the primary care relationship, one of the advantages that we have is that we do have the opportunity to, if we are lucky enough to earn that patient's trust to come see us again and build that relationship that can also build that uh, comfortable space or create a comfortable space for them to share. And many times the more that they share, some you know, then we can appropriately and continuously um, link them to proper resources, let it be mental health resources or whatever resources they may need. Um, and one of the things that I, I would like to mention is that I think the trauma-informed approach is probably one of the most important things to remember. Having said that, sometimes you know we think the trauma-informed approach, and maybe I'll hear that physicians go into the CDC website or the refugee uh, website that the CDC has and will look up the information like what do I need to screen this patient for like how many bacteria or diseases do I need to screen them that are not part of the U.S. That's a really good approach in terms of like let me think about things that I may not be in my radar that I may forget to screen this person for but let's not forget about the typical also preventive healthcare needs that many times immigrants fail to be able to complete because of the circumstances and the frequent migration, right? So one of the things that I would ask uh, people to think about is that that person may have not had a usual source of care for years. If they've been living in a you know, refugee camp or if they have been um, fleeing a country for years and they've relocated three times, then what are the odds that they have had a mammogram or a colonoscopy or that they, they may or may not be up to date with vaccines? So at the same time that if a patient encounters you and they have a rectal bleed. Yes, do test for and look for infections and things for things like that. But also, if the patient is of, of a certain age, think, I'm going to get this patient a colonoscopy, right? Or at least ask, ask those questions, because those are also frequently missed. And if we're not in a position to do so, let's try to also link these patients to, um, to have a home and have a, a patient uh, to be linked to a patient-centered medical home. That was great. Uh, and I was really enjoyed hearing this because we often decouple our traditional healthcare model and the screenings that we set, whether it be for colorectal cancer screening or mammograms um, or any other uh, types of healthcare, because we make the assumption that these individuals coming to uh, our country are only going to need a certain type of healthcare. And we um, don't think of um, immigrant patients as our traditional patients within the U.S. healthcare system. And yes, they suffer from, uh, they can suffer from diabetes and they can suffer from uh, high blood pressure and high cholesterol, just like any mm -hmm. other patient presenting to our doors. Mm -hmm. And so can you talk a little bit more about what other considerations we may need to be thinking about with reviewing data from our patients uh, or when we're, we're meeting those patients, whether it be for the first time or for the fifth mm -hmm. time? Yeah, I think one of the things that is important to 
I think a lot, a lot of people may think that this is true, but is that we don't sometimes have any data, right? So when, whenever you encounter some of these patients, unless they have specific recollection of when these things happened, you, we should probably set them up for the best success possible by being able to provide all the preventive services. So one of the things that happens frequently when we see children is we may not have any record of vaccinations. That's a big deal because kids have require a lot of vaccinations. So many times in the pediatric clinic, we have to, we do testing, obviously, to, to look and see whether there's any evidence of vaccination. Sometimes we have to give them a bunch of a, a bunch of vaccines. But I, I, I guess one of the things that, that, that I have seen and heard is, oh, but why is this person coming from this other country and doesn't have any, you know, any healthcare preventive stuff done? Do they not have a, 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 a robust healthcare system or does the patient not care? And it doesn't have to be any of those things. None of these things have to be true. They could have a robust healthcare system. The patient um, could have had more uh, preventive care, but it's not a position to, to judge. So I think one of the main things is that even if somebody did everything perfect, it's almost impossible for one of the one one of the, these immigrants to come in and say, "Here's all my records. This are, this is when I had my, you know, last PPD test or when I had this vaccine." That's not going to happen. So we have to essentially meet them where they're at and um, help them then establish a, a, a record in the the U.S. healthcare system. Thank you. And then just another question, because we we've, we've um, the two prior speakers have. Um, brought up social determinants of health. And I think we just need to drive home that social and structural drivers of health uh, are really important uh, for any population, but specifically for our, our immigrant um, patient populations. And so can you give me your thoughts on um, why we need to be focusing on those social and structural drivers of health? Yes. I also, thank you for bringing that point again. I also wanted to mention something that I remembered from a previous comment that Dr. Sadi shared. Um, I, I wanted to share that there's a common misconception that immigrants come uh, to the United States and that everyone just wants to come into the United States. I understand that it feels that way maybe for some people, but that's not really what the facts are. Um, the majority of, for example, um, of, of immigrants are internally displaced in their own country, and that's more than 70%. And then another big fraction is displaced to the neighboring country, so to a, 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 an adjacent country. And the U.S. is not anywhere near the top 10 um, countries that accept refugees. So I just wanted to kind of mention that really quickly. And then in terms of the migration and social determinants of health, it is one of those, not, it's one of those things that like it's not like a gift that keeps on giving in the sense that migration follows you throughout your whole life once you come in to the united states to whatever country is not the country of your origin you are that is affecting how you interact with the world because you may be communicating in a, sec in a different language you may communi be communicating in a second language and therefore have limited english proficiency you you likely it would be very unlikely if you didn't experience trauma as Dr. Verma shared during the migration phase, during the settlement phase, if you, there's a certain percentage of people that 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 uh, move back. So during the adjustment phase and also the discrimination that can come in with that. And then there is um, all, all sorts of trauma that go associated with that. But as you walk through the world, just from, from many of us may not be that hard to imagine, but imagine having to learn a whole new health, health and education system and not understanding how, when do I go to the ER? When do I see a primary care provider? Things as simple as that could become really complex problems for, um, for people that are already have been through a lot of trauma and continue to go through a lot of trauma. And that also, as Dr. Sadi mentioned before, discrimination, racism, all of these things also affect your ability to get a job or take employment or um, how you feel and how safe you feel when you, uh, as you do your daily activities. And that's all of those considerations take on another level also when you are not alone and you have children to take care of or elderly parents, et cetera. So individual factors, social factors, learning a new, uh, a new law, uh, 
a, a new a system of laws. All of this is going to affect the experience and the health outcomes that our patient is going to have. So just thinking about that continuity and thinking about all of those phases of migration and that the trauma doesn't end, is just that it's experienced differently and that the ability of different patients to cope with different uh, types of trauma is also also different. Thank you. Um, and so I, I now want to popcorn around to uh, in the last few minutes that we have together and just ask a, a couple of uh, other clarifying questions uh, for our audience. And so, uh, Dr. Saadi, I, I, there is, we've talked about trauma-informed care. We've heard that a number of times. Um, but I think there's something else that is underlying to this, which is um, developing trust uh, between uh, the uh, healthcare system and uh, the providers uh, with the patients and the communities. And so can you talk to us about the importance of trust? Um, yes. Um, before I do, I'm going to just add a little comment about uh, just to piggyback off of the around the continuum of experiences for immigrants. Um, you know, I think which I, I just I do a lot of work with people in immigration detention. And I think when we had published a paper, started really trying to push people to also think about immigration detention as a possible uh, sort of point where people might experience uh, trauma along their migration journey. Right. For especially um, in the U.S., that's becoming increasingly used. And so and that can sometimes happen during the journey phase. That sometimes can happen in the post-migration phase. Right. So a lot of times people are in this in-between detention often for even um, uh, you know upwards of three, four years in the US, um, you can be held in uh, indefinite detention, um, which is not the case in other countries. And so I just wanted to flag that as another point or intercept at which you could experience trauma. Um, I think uh, when it comes to trust and it's a huge, uh, a huge issue, I, I would say sort of two things. One is, goes back to my um, initial comments about reframing a lot of these conversations. We really need to think uh, about um, uh, mistrust as very much serving a, a protective factor for individuals, right? That it's not something that is wrong with them, that they're like mistrusting. Why are they not trusting clinicians? Um, some people have been in places where they've been perpetrated harms by physicians, right? And that has happened where uh, people will, will have been in prison in their home country and a physician watched them be tortured, right? We um, saw that um, uh, in Iraq, right? Uh, and in uh, Guantanamo, where people literally, you know, physicians were watching people um, uh, commit um, uh, these heinous acts. And so we have to just be mindful that for a lot of people, the mistrust is protective. And so we have to shift the focus from, oh, how do we make them trust us? Uh, we have to sort of shift the sort of the locus of responsibility from those individuals to us, right? To us as providers, um, to us within organizations. Um, you know, so what can also organizations do to uh, facilitate trust? Um, we have a, uh, I did a, a research project um, that was really thinking about how organizations um, can uh, promote uh, the concept of um, sort of sanctuary or immigration friendly uh, institutions. Um, you guys can check it out. It's like doctorsforimmigrants.com and we have like a toolkit for institutions. But things like when someone is coming and making their first appointment, are you asking for a social security number? Right. And what would that do to someone who doesn't have it if that if that's their first point of contact? Right. What um, you know, the when we talk about you know, during the covid pandemic that happened, right, for example, um, there was this rollout of virtual visits. And I remember even in the initial in my with my um, patients in one of my community health centers, they would ask questions like, well, who's listening in on this conversation? What's going to happen to this visit? Right. And these are conversations we should we should be proactive about having when we set it up, we should say this is confidential. This is you know not going to be shared with other, other government agencies. Right. We the these responses um, should not be reactive. Right. That it, we really need to be more proactive in thinking about what can we do to like um, to build trust uh, uh, among people. Uh, who have every right uh, to uh, be wary of us, you know, given um, uh, healthcare um, and healthcare professionals sort of long uh, history of um, harm um, uh, perpetrated on uh, marginalized populations, including immigrants. 
Uh, thank you. And Dr. Verma, um, you, you brought up something that I want to bring to the forefront uh, for this discussion is um, for the providers, for the physicians and the other clinicians that are caring for uh, immigrant patients, there's a high, turn uh, high turnover and high levels of burnout. Uh, and can you talk to a little bit uh, more about uh, the importance of um, you know, having not only the appropriate training, but also the appropriate support for those individuals who are on the front lines uh, helping to care for these vulnerable populations? Oh, thank you for bringing the topic up. Uh, I mean, the work but that we do, it's profoundly for us, right? It's profoundly meaningful for us because of our own personal experiences and professional experiences. But I, I think what I've been seeing, um, you know, working in the space, it's uh, folks sort of really cutting down their time or becoming burned out because if we are just hearing these traumatic narratives, folks can develop something called vicarious traumatization, right? So now there's more recent um, shift in that um, term to transition into something called vicarious traumatic, vicarious post-traumatic growth. It's sort of shifting your relationship with the stories, with the experiences that we are hearing from our patients. And that, and it's not limited to the stories itself. It's often also coming from feeling hopeless or helpless, right? And just sort of taking a step back and reflecting on how could someone go through that? How are people, going back to Dr. Sadi's point about how the different policies, you know, um, can result in these forcibly mass displacements, right? So it's for someone um, to take a step back and seek support. There's several um, resources out there at the national and the international level. One of the resources that I would recommend checking out is the International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies. They have something called Vicarious Trauma Toolkit. Um, so I would highly encourage folks to look into similar resources. If not that, I, I have no disclosures uh, with that uh, to announce here, but um, but their toolkit is uh, it's really it's really important um, work. So, um, and they also talk about the self-care for providers and so on. But at the, at the end of the day, folks are able to find their support groups, right? Because as much as we are there to support our patients, we also need to make sure we have that um, sort of solidified for ourselves. And recognizing that we're coming close to the um, end of our time together, I just want to go rapid fire to uh, all three of the presenters and just ask um, if there's a point that we have um, missed over, glossed over, uh, that you would really want uh, our audience to take home. So whether it be something practical that they can use uh, and uh, engaging uh, a patient who is uh, a new immigrant to our country uh, or to uh, a policymaker um, who um, they can engage uh, and help to improve uh, the care for a community or, or a special population. Um, but just any other take home points that we may have uh, not had a chance to really dive into. And so I'll go to you first, Maria, and hopefully we can keep these comments brief so we can wrap up and be close to on time. I think I would just like to highlight and bring back the asylum training initiative. There's free trainings for a baseline of our basic training is less than 15 hours and then you do continuously the medical education uh, training and you can go in a lot more depth into some of the the, the needs that that these particular populations have it, it touches on the trauma informed approach it touches on also the self-care that dr verma was talking about and how to kind of pace yourself with the work and it also talks about special uh, and vulnerable patients. And just completing that training, I have been able to help a lot more patients in our clinic, which is not a formal refugee asylum clinic, um, with um, affidavit documentation and with and and through other ways to help in many of their immigration um, cases. So I definitely recommend that everybody that's interested checks it out. And to you, Dr. Zadi. Um, I would say one point that I, I think um, we didn't touch on is, an, you know, even though we have the title of this talk being Immigrant Health, for us to recognize that 
there are really so many, there's so much heterogeneity um, in this group, right? Um, and different experiences, even in terms of reasons of migration, right? People migrate across a continuum of agency from completely voluntary to completely involuntary or forced migration, um, that there are differences in experience in terms of uh, racial ethnic uh, groups. And so just to be mindful uh, that even um, when we have talks and uh, like this, have that sort of group everyone together under the broad umbrella of immigrant health for us to recognize um, the incredible um, heterogeneity that exists um, uh, in this group across multiple sort of um, axes. And to you, Dr. Berman. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Sadi, for mentioning that was I was about to highlight because mental health outcomes are certainly different depending on the type of immigrant population that we are treating. So one last point I wanted to bring was about um, really putting all the different disciplines together and helping someone not only establish themselves in this new land, uh, but also help them thrive in ways that um, focuses on their strengths rather than focusing more and repeatedly on their negative experiences. Thank you for that. And so I wanna say again, thank you to our three panelists. Thank you to Dr. Burma, Dr. Sadi, and Dr. Portella for joining us. Thank you for your insights. Thank you for uh, helping us uh, to become better um, uh, clinicians, physicians, uh, caregivers um, for a population that uh, needs our uh, support, our kindness, our, res our respect. Uh, and I uh, wanna say thank you just for your continued work in this space uh, and uh, your leadership in this space. Uh, I want to bring up a couple of slides just to highlight some ongoing events that we have um, here within uh, the Office for Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Partnership. Um, our uh, Commonwealth Fund Fellowship in Minority Health Policy is open and accepting applications. Uh, the deadline for the fellowship is December 1st. Uh, you can find out more information on our website. And also, we will host another um, Equity and Social Justice webinar on physicians and the role for advocacy in medicine, uh, which is very much in uh, continuum with this conversation that we are having here. Uh, and registration will be opening uh, for that uh, today. And that will be on Tuesday, December 12th, also at noon. And uh, is there another slide? Uh, with that, I wanna say thank you for joining. There will be a quick poll that pops up. It's a three or four question poll. Uh, if you can quickly answer those questions. Uh, thank you to Lynn for being here in the background uh, and organizing our presentation. Thank you to Dr. Reed for uh, the, the uh, leadership within the DICP. And again, thank you to our panelists for being here. And with that, have a good rest of your day. Take care.